Bacteria come in all kinds of different shapes and sizes, and they also can have relationships with one another. No, I'm not talking about a bacterial dating app. What I'm talking about is the fact that certain bacteria live in very close proximity together, and some of them are actually physically attached to each other. So that's what we're going to talk about in this video. So stay tuned while we talk about bacterial shapes and relationships. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. Today we're gonna to be talking about the different shapes of bacteria that we find in the natural world, as well as the relationships that these bacteria can have with each other. Now, first let's start by talking about the basic shapes that we find in most bacterial species. There are six common shapes that we find. The first is what we call a coccus. The plural of that is a cocci. So a coccus is a spherical shaped bacteria. Now, when you look under a microscope, quite often they're going to look sort of like flat circles, but understand that they are actually three-dimensional, so they're going to exist as spheres. Other bacteria exist in what we call a rod shape, and these are also known as the bacillus shape. You can see that they are sort of long sort of cylinders. Uh, sometimes they're rounded on the end, sometimes they're sort of squared off. Either way, they're referred to as either a rod or a bacillus. Uh, the old term uh, used to be referred to them as, uh, as bacilli, plural. Um, but we now recognize a specific group of bacteria as the bacillus, um, and they are a certain group of rod-shaped bacteria, um, but there are also other rod-shaped bacteria like the clostridium, for example. So uh, you're not wrong if you refer to this shape as a bacilli, um, but rod is probably the more accurate term that we commonly use to describe them. Now, uh, both cocci and rods can exist in both gram-positive and gram-negative forms. But pretty much every other species that we're going to discuss is almost exclusively referred to or is exclusively gram negative in terms of its structure. So the next one we'll talk about is what we call the vibrio. And vibrio are comma shaped. They're almost like somebody took a rod bacterium and they, they bent it in the middle. Uh, so vibrio uh, are these sort of comma shaped rods and they are, they are gram negative in nature. Now, if we take a rod and then we twist it slightly, this leads to something called a spiral or a spirilla. Uh, plural or singular is spirillum. So uh, spirals are also gram negative. They are almost as if you take a gram negative rod and sort of twisted it on itself and they can be recognized as this sort of squiggly shape. The fifth shape we'll talk about is also a gram negative, uh, are made of gram negative bacteria, although we don't typically do gram staining on them. These are what we call the spirochetes. So the spirochetes are going to look a lot more like corkscrew pasta. You can see that there, there, there are many more turns in a spirochete as compared to a spirillum. Uh, the other thing to note about a spirochete is that they uh, are very wriggly. They move using these endoflagella. We talked about that in our video on uh, prokaryotic cell structure. Uh, they have these endoflagella that allow them to move. Um, typically, we don't do gram staining on these guys, and one of the reasons why is, is because they're so thin and hair-like, um, it's often hard to see spirochetes um, using standard light microscopy. Often, we have to use something called dark field microscopy, or we have to label them with fluorescent antibodies uh, in order to actually be able to see these guys very well uh, under a microscope. The sixth common shape we find in bacteria are what we call the branching filamentous uh, structures, and uh, these are found in in, spe in, in certain species where they kind of have this sort of branching, almost like a fungal appearance uh, to them when you look at them under a microscope. So those are the six basic shapes. Now, when we talk about bacteria, and in particular how bacteria reproduce, they reproduce through a process called binary fission. Essentially, they clone each other. Um, they, they, they do what is very similar to what happens when a eukaryotic cell undergoes mitosis. They reproduce their genome. They do what we call DNA replication, uh, and then they grow, and then they pinch off. But in some cases, those cells do not separate completely. They remain attached to each other. And this leads to something called a colonial formation. Now, one particular bacterial shape that's very prone to doing this are the cocci. Um, and they can, they can form these colonial formations that are based on the geometry of their division or their, I should say, their failed septation. So for example, if we look at a species like Streptococcus pneumoniae, this actually exists where there's almost always two cells bound together. So a coccus is a singular individual spherical cell, bacterial cell. If we have two attached to each other in a colonial arrangement, this is what we call a 
diplococcus. Now, if we take that diplococcus uh, and we get a different, a different type of arrangement where they actually join together end to end in these long chains, this is what we refer to as a streptococcus. The way I always try to remember is they're gonna exist in strips, strip, streptococcus. These are gonna be long chains of spherical bacteria. Other times though, they form in these irregular bunches. They almost look like grapes uh, when you look at them three-dimensionally and they sort of uh, fail, to, they divide in all different, uh, different um, spaces relative to each other and you get this sort of bunch of grapes appearance to them. Uh, when they have these irregular clusters, this is what we refer to as a staphylococcus or a staph species. So things like staphylococcus aureus, staphylococcus epidermidis exist in these big bunches of irregular clusters of attached spherical bacteria. They can, also do, uh, they can also divide somewhat geometrically. So they can exist as a tetrad, for example, where you just have four right next to each other, or they can, do what's, they can form what's called a sarsina. A sarsina almost looks like a box. Uh, there are eight of them. It's like two tetrads uh, basically attached to each other. They look like a bacterial Rubik's cube, if you will, a bunch of spherical bacteria in almost like a, like a, in a box type pattern. So that's a sarsina. Rods can also have this happen to them. Although the only real colonial formation available to a rod is the strepto, the chains of them. Uh, so they almost look like a bunch of, of, of hot dogs joined together, a bunch of sausage links all still attached. And this is what we call a streptobacillus. Now, the thing to realize is this. All prokaryotic cells are unicellular. There is no multicellularity with respect to prokaryotic cells. We only find multicellular life consisting of eukaryotic cells. And the big difference between a colonial unicellular organism and a truly multicellular organism is the fact that multicellularity requires those cells to differentiate and become interdependent with each other. If you think about the types of cells you find in your body, they're all different. You've got liver cells that make up your liver and skin cells that make up your skin and red blood cells that carry oxygen and so on and so forth. And they're all dependent on each other. You can't just have a red blood cell living on its own. It requires the other cells to deliver it oxygen and and, and to create it and so on and so forth. When we look at colonial arrangements, we are looking at, in particular, a single, all cells must A, belong to a single species, and B, there's no differentiation. Each cell in that particular streptococcus or staphylococcus can live all on its own. It's no different than any other cell it's attached to. Now, they can behave slightly differently when they're in the colonial formation, but that being said, they do not constitute truly a branch of multicellular life. They are colonial unicellular organisms. But that being said, uh, bacteria can often coexist with, with each other. Now, what we're going to talk about now is the interdependent relationships that bacteria and, and actually all organisms can have with each other. We're going to talk about symbiotic and non-symbiotic relationships. Now, we tend to have in our everyday life this connotation that symbiosis means good. And as you'll see in a few minutes, symbiosis does not exclusively mean good. Things that are symbiotic are not necessarily good for each other. Some of those symbiotic relationships are actually quite toxic to one or more of the individuals involved. When we talk about relationships between species as being either symbiotic or non-symbiotic, it is not a connotation of positive or negative. What it is, what a symbiotic relationship means is that one or more of the individuals in that relationship require that relationship in order to survive. There needs to be an obligation for one of those species in that relationship in order for it to survive. It doesn't mean they all have to require it, but it means that at least one of the participating um, species requires that relationship to survive. Non-symbiotic relationships are sort of non-obligatory. They can either be in them or they don't have to be. We'll talk about those in just a minute. So let's start with the symbiotic relationships. There are three types of symbiotic relationships that exist in, the, in, in nature. The first one is what we call mutualism. And you can think of mutualism as good, good, okay? Mutualism is where both species involved require the relationship, but they both benefit from it. So for example, many of the bacterial species that live in our body, part of our normal microbiome, are mutualistic with us. We need them to survive because they help to digest our food and provide us with nutrition, or they help protect us from foreign invaders. On the other hand, they need us to survive because we provide them with a home. We provide them with an environment in which to live. We deliver them the raw materials that they can use to power their metabolism and so on and so forth. It's a good, good relationship. 
but we both require it. If all of our bacteria suddenly left us, we probably wouldn't be able to survive. And if they left our bodies, they wouldn't be able to survive elsewhere. They need us, we need them. That's a mutual, a mutualistic relationship. Take a step down and we end up with what we call a commensal relationship. A commensal relationship has one species that doesn't require it, but is not harmed by the relationship. The other species, referred to as the commensal, absolutely requires and benefits from that relationship. Now, some of the microbes that live in our body are commensal with us. We don't need them, but they need us. But being inside of our body, they don't harm us, they don't hurt us, they don't do anything bad to us. We're just happy to have them there. We also see, you guys have ever noticed, uh, ever seen like Shark Week um, uh, on TV. In Shark Week, you often find that sharks have these little fish that swim alongside them. Many of these fish actually need that relationship. Turns out that sharks are incredibly sloppy eaters. When they eat something, they don't eat it particularly tidily. So a bunch of pieces of that food go all over the place and these little fish swim along and they, that's how they get their food. Does the shark need that little fish swimming next to it? Absolutely not. The shark is gonna go out and hunt and eat and so on and so forth. But that other fish needs that shark. It's the commensal. So a, a, a commensal relationship or commensalism is where one species does not require the relationship, but is not harmed by that relationship. Whereas the other species known as the commensal requires and benefits from that relationship. Now let's get to the dark side of symbiotic relationships, parasitism. In terms of human health, one, parasitism might be one of the most studied relationships uh, in terms of medicine, because most of the things that we're concerned about, those pathogens, they are parasitic. But a parasitic relationship is a symbiotic one. In a parasitic relationship, the parasite requires and benefits from that relationship. Usually they're stealing nutrition or feeding off of their host. The host, on the other hand, does not require that relationship and is harmed by it. But it is still considered to be a symbiotic relationship because symbiosis focuses on the necessity of the relationship, not on the benefit of the relationship. So parasitism is a symbiotic relationship. You are technically in a symbiotic relationship with your tapeworm if you have one. You, of course, don't want your tapeworm and are harmed by your tapeworm, but your tapeworm needs you. Your parasite needs you. Uh, so that's a parasitic relationship. So as you can see, symbiotic is not synonymous with good. It's synonymous with ob obligation. Now let's turn to the non-symbiotic relationships. There are two major types of non-symbiotic relationship. There's what we call antagonism and what we call synergism. So we'll start with antagonism. Antagonism is just what it seems like. It's sort of a lose-lose. Many species are engaged in an antagonistic relationship with other species. It's not required, so it's not symbiotic but it does exist. A great example of antagonism actually comes from the world of the human microbiome. Most of the species that exist on or in our bodies are mutualistic or commensal with us, but they are antagonistic towards many of the pathogens that might harm us. So for example, if your Staphylococcus epidermidis living on the skin of a human being, that's your home. You live there. That makes you happy. You benefit from that relationship and the host is happy to have you there. The main reason why the host is happy to have you there, by the way, is because if another invasive species, a pathogen like Staphylococcus aureus shows up and decides I'm gonna live here, that Staphylococcus epidermidis is like, no, thank you, I'm already here, I already live here. If somebody walked into your home and just sat on your couch and said, this is my house now, are you gonna put up with it? Absolutely not. Boom, all of a sudden you find yourself in an antagonistic relationship. And that's what happens with many of the microbes that live in our body, many of the microbes that are part of our uh, the part of our microbiome are antagonistic to things that would otherwise be harmful to us. They would act as parasites towards us. So not required. Nothing has to be in an antagonistic relationship. Quite often we find ourselves in an antagonistic relationship because it's not a required relationship. It's more of an association. It is referred to as non-symbiotic. The opposite of that is what we call synergism. Now, if you've ever been in corporate America, you may have had somebody come into your workplace and talk about synergism. Team, together, everybody achieves more. I mean, I guess that's what synergism refers to. Synergism refers to the fact that when two things uh, are working together, they, they are actually more benefited than they would be just, it's basically the, the whole is greater than the sum of the two parts, basically. It's that, it's that type of relationship. A perfect example of synergism are what we call biofilms. So biofilms are these relationships um, uh, that are, are these relationships between individuals within one species, or in many cases, multiple different species. In fact, in many cases, these bacterial biofilms that form also involve eukaryotes as well. 
And biofilms are particularly interesting. Biofilms only form on surfaces. Now that surface can be a lot of different things. It could be the inside of a pipe. It could be your teeth, for example, in the case of dental plaque. It could be a medical implant. It could be something like a pacemaker, uh, or it could be a catheter. And biofilms can form on these surfaces when, when certain species of bacteria get together and they actually can talk to each other through a process called quorum sensing. It's a communication mechanism that allows them to interact and work together to form these biofilms. Now, in a biofilm, the species that are involved in a biofilm are not required to be there. That's why it's not an obligate relationship. It's not a symbiotic relationship, but by becoming a participant or a member of this biofilm, they benefit greatly for several reasons. First and foremost, they can work together to form protective structures. So they can form a very intense glycocalyx or a capsule that can prevent them from being damaged uh, by the outside environment. By the way, that outside environment could also be referred to as damage from things like antibiotics or macrophages or cellular defenses that exist in your body in the case of about two thirds of all medical infections. That's right, about two thirds of all medical infection, medically relevant infections involve in some way biofilms, uh, according to the latest research. But they can also communicate with each other. They can work together and sort of subdivide the labor. That's actually something that's been observed in biofilms is certain species act in, in defense mechanism while other species work to provide nutrition and so on and so forth. They can actually become much more energy efficient and much more resistant to being eliminated or being destroyed because they're cooperating in this biofilm. The other thing that can happen in biofilms is the sharing of genetic information. And biofilms are particularly scary for, to, to, to doctors and medical researchers for, for one of this is for one of the major reasons. In biofilms, we see the, the increased spreading of genetic information. This can actually include the spreading of resistance genes that are found on bacterial plasmids um, through the sharing of horizontal gene transfer. This in turn, along with the glycocalyx that these guys often secrete, can actually increase antibiotic resistance in biofilms by a thousand fold. Think about how scary that is. That means you would need to increase the dose of antibiotic you give your patient by a thousand times to actually make it effective. And given the fact that about two thirds of all human infections involves in some way biofilm formation, that's really scary. So biofilms are a great example of a synergistic relationship. None of the species that are involved in the biofilm require it, but they benefit greatly from participating in it. And given the fact that we're now learning how relevant those are to many human diseases, um, we're becoming increasingly aware of of how biofilms form, how they spread, and how we can eradicate them to help fight off and, and defeat certain infections to keep our patients healthy. Hey, thank you so much for tuning in today. So that was our conversation about bacterial shapes. Remember the six common shapes, coccus, rod, vibrio, spiral, spirochete, and branching filamentous. And also remember the different types of relationships we see in terms of colonial arrangements, which involve a single species and are based on cell division, whereas we've got our symbiotic and non-symbiotic relationships, which are often between multiple species. Uh, and remember, when it, comes to, when it comes to symbiosis, it doesn't necessarily mean good, it just means obligatory. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. I hope you guys learned a lot today, and I will talk to you guys next time.